to authority, uh, the third take. Reading from verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 2, if you would like to follow the reading, that is. This is the word of the Lord. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Thus far we read in God's holy and infallible word. Our text today is verses 18 through 20. Servants be subject to your masters with all fear, and so on. Verses 18, 19, and 20. Submission to authority, take two. Just to remind you that uh, Peter has told uh, these strangers and pilgrims whom he's writing to from a dungeon in Rome about himself to be martyred. He's writing to them, uh, explaining to them uh, where um, they have come from, how it is that they are pilgrims and strangers in this world, because God has made them such, separated them from the world to himself, and now they belong to him. Verse 9 of chapter 2, he gives us there a clear definition of what God's people, God's elect are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And here in these ensuing verses to the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, he gives us some admonishments that, um, admonition, sorry, that, um, well, they put flesh on what he means by showing forth the praises of God, showing forth the attributes, the greatness, the wonder of our God. 
that men and women might see and behold by their conduct and their confession that they belong to this great God who has called them out of darkness. No longer do they walk in darkness. They are done with that. Now they walk in the light as they have been called into it. And so they walk after they follow the light, the light of the world, and they conduct themselves in the same way as Jesus Christ himself, verses 21 to the end, as Jesus Christ himself conducted himself in this world. What it means to follow Christ. So we saw in verses 13 through uh, 17, we saw that we are to be subject to the state, we're to honour the king, we're to honour, we're to submit ourselves to authority. It begins with the parents in the home, and then of course, from there on, the school, the college, the state, the government, the army major, uh, staff sergeant, sergeant major, um, yeah, yeah. The policeman on the street, whoever, anyone who has authority over us. And this includes, of course, our employer. Here in our text, in verses, the verses um, 18, 19, and 20. This is, um, this is an, an admonishment um, to be in subjection, in submission, rather, further, to... Um, to those who have authority over us in the workplace. The word here refers to household servants. That's the word that he uses here in verse 18. It's not the word that's used for slaves. Though, of course, um, it could mean slaves. Um, uh, employees, you know, somebody who works in a family home perhaps maybe, and they're a servant in that family home, and this is how they're to conduct themselves as a servant in that family home. Now the person, this person may well do, may well be a, a slave, not necessarily so, but may well be. And of course, um, um, well, the the issue of slavery, uh, that's a complex issue, yeah? We'll come back, we'll look at that in the next message. But let's just take it at the moment. This is a servant, this is a worker, this is a, an employee, employed, whether it be by a family, whether it be in a factory, whatever it might be, a Christian's place of employment in this world. And you might notice that there's a chain here, subjection to the state and the state's authority, verse 13. Here, subjection to our employer, verse 18. And then chapter 3 and verse 1, there's another um, submission to authority, and that's wives in submission to their own husbands. So, um, here um, we have an example, verses 21 through 25, um, an example given to us of what submission means, what it looks like. And of course, um, if we say that we are followers of Christ and we kick against, we rebel against what Peter is laying down for us here in terms of submission to the state, to our employers, and wives to their husbands, well, you're not following Christ at all. The very opposite. So um, it's an important subject because it's well it's spoken of again and again in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, uh, Colossians 3, verse 22, 1 Timothy 6, verse 1, Titus 2, verse 9. Sub, um, subjection. Submission, servants submission to their masters again and again and again. It's a, another way by which we show forth the praises of the God who has called us out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. So there are three things here, the employer, uh, the beauty, and the endurance. The employer, verse 18, and the beauty, verse 19, and the endurance, verse 20. First of all, the employer, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, to your employers with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. We have to remember that by nature we are sinners, that is, rebels against God. And that rebellious nature uh, is still with us. The old man, the old nature, you know. More and more we're struggling and we're striving to walk in the Spirit and to have the Spirit of God dominate, dominate our lives rather than be ruled by the flesh, that old rebellious nature. And of course, when we give place to rebellion, when we give place to the opposite to what Peter is laying down for us here, well, the more and more we encourage, the more and more the flesh will take over and dominate us all over again. So you see, the... Um, the rebellion uh, in man, in mankind, well, it manifests itself in a whole host of ways. It manifests itself in the anarchy, the rebellion against the state. We're seeing that in these days, are we not? Seeing it here in the United Kingdom. See it constantly on the news feeds and uh, on the internet here concerning uh, things in the United States of America at this time. Anarchy, rebellion, that's, that's, the, that's man's nature coming out. That's man's nature in the raw coming out. Rebellion, anarchy against authority, against the state and against the agents of the state. And of course, it's seen too in the workplace. Anarchy, rebellion against one's employer. Here, of course, Peter's talking about um, a family situation, a family servant, a household servant. That's what the word refers to. But it's universal, a universal issue. It crosses all the lines of... Um, of employment, you know, whatever, wherever a person's employed. And these admonitions, they are ignored, are they not? Even by Christians, even by Christians. Totally, total disregard, total disrespect, no love for their employers, no fidelity towards their employers. It's unchristian conduct. It's sin, it's rebellion, and not just against one's employers, but against God himself and against Christ. It's unchristlike. Read verses 21 through 25. We'll come to them eventually, but read them and see. It's unchristlike. You say you're a Christian, you want to be Christ-like, you want to be formed to the image of his uh, of Christ? Well, if you're in rebellion, a state of insurrection and sedition against your employer, not in subjection to your employer, then you are anything but like Christ-like. It's transgression against the word of God. All the talk about workers' rights, you know, refusal to work properly, go slow, harassing your employer so that you can get more money out of him or her, uh, better maybe conditions and more benefits um, from your employer. All kinds of means used, you know, to come against your employer, to coerce your employer, to give you what you want. That is not Christian. That is not what Peter has in mind here. Or maybe looking for a better boss, a better employer, or a better, better conditions and better place of work. Oh, this is a hard saying, especially in this modern age in which we live. 
This is a hard thing for workers, Christian and otherwise. It really, really is. But it's clear, it's emphatic, we are to be in submission to the state, to authority, to employers, and wives are to be in submission to their husbands. That the latter doesn't go down well in this feministic society either. All this is contrary to the modern age. All this is contrary to the natural man and mind and woman. Because the natural state, the unregenerate man or woman, this is just absolutely, this is out of the question. This is out of the question. No way. But it's clear, it's emphatic, it's the word of God, and the basis for it is again in the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and mother. That's where our authority, the learning of authority, the answering to authority, submission to submitting to authority, that's where it begins. And it grows from there and out of there. Respect, love, fidelity to one's state and to one's employer, the woman to her husband. Love, honor, respect your employer. Hmm? How about that? And how about that for conditions in your contract of employment? Huh? Would you sign that? You're to love your employer, respect your employer, and you're to be totally faithful to your employer, respecting him or her at all times, in every circumstance, giving to them the best work that you possibly can, to your utmost, the best work, and of course doing everything in your power that you possibly can do to benefit the company, to benefit your employer. What does this say about membership in unions, trade unions I mean? Workers' unions. I mean, think, what's the purpose of these unions? Isn't it to coerce? Isn't it to blackmail employers to get more, to get more out of their employers? What is it the unions do if the employers don't get, if their members don't get what they want, enough of what they want, the conditions and the benefits of what they want, what is it the unions do? They say, well, we'll withdraw the workforce. We'll bring them out and strike. We'll bring the company to a standstill. I've heard them here in this country in past days. They've somewhat lost their power here, but in past days, they've held not only companies, they've held the very government to ransom. They've brought the nation to a standstill. Back in the 60s and 70s, blackmail, blackmail, coercion. It's sin, it's transgression. God forbids it. So should we as Christians, should we be members of such unions? The purpose is nothing but blackmail. Of course, the only out to this submission to your employer is when your employer bids you to do something that's contrary to the law and to the word of God. Then it's a no. Then it's a, it's, it's, it's a definite no. And we're to do this with fear, for, with fear, says, um, be subject to your masters with all fear, says Peter, not terror, that's not the word, fear, respect, much respect, submission, all these submissions, wife to the husband, to the state, to the employer, all these submissions are for God's sake. Yeah? For the Lord's sake, for the Lord who chose us, for the Lord who bought us with his own precious blood. For his sake, 
all of these submissions. Fear is a Christian virtue. We're to walk in fear of the Lord, not in terror of him, because love, perfect love, casts out fear. It's not that fear. It's not, it's not the fear of, of, of wrath or torment, of terror. It's the respect, it's the awe. We hold God in awe. And so we walk before him in awe. Deep respect, holy respect, in fear. It's a Christian virtue. And it applies to our calling out of darkness into the light. It applies to our relationship to our employer, to the state, and it, and it applies to our relationship with God as well. Verse 13, if you go back there, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Because he has placed, Christ has done this. Christ has placed your, whoever your employer is, whether it be the government, a private company, whoever it be, Christ, Jesus Christ himself has placed your, your employer in authority over you. And he requires you to submit to that employer in him because he has placed that employer in authority over you. And you're to conduct yourself in the way just as though you were doing it for Jesus Christ himself. And we do this to earn our daily bread. To earn our daily bread. There's two kinds of bosses, of course, says Peter. There are some who have, of course, have no care for their employees. This is difficult, is it not? Uh, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Well, the froward are those who are um, perverse, you know, self-willed, perverse, nasty, not good bosses, you know. And of course, there's plenty of them. And, um, and they have no care for their employees, how, how they treat them. You know, their employees are just there for their benefits, you know. They're just a piece of rubbing rag, you know, in, in their sight, you know, by their attitudes, you know. Of course, you may have a Christian boss, and of course the temptation would be there, wouldn't it? Because he's a Christian boss, yeah, you take advantage, um, uh, you take advantage, um, you know, because he is maybe kind and because he is gentle. That too would be sinful. That too would be contrary to what Peter's teaching us here. Then, of course, there's the, there's the downright, there's the outright crooked and perverse. Those who would take advantage of us because of our submission to them. But our attitude says Peter is to be exactly the same. It doesn't matter what kind of boss you have, whether it's a good and gentle one, or whether it's a froward, a perverse one, your attitude is to be exactly the same. You are to give to him, you are to give to him obedience to the fifth commandment. He's an authority over you, placed there by Jesus Christ, and so you are to submit to him willingly, lovingly, respectfully. And that means, of course, that um, you talk to him with respect, and that means even when he is not present, that you talk of him with respect. Remember what it is that we are. We're pilgrims and strangers in this world. We're just passing through, that's all. 
we are on our way to the Father's home. Then everything will be perfect. Then everything will be wonderfully well. Then our suffering. Then, then there'll be an end of the froward, the perverse and self-willed boss. It's only a temporary situation while we are in this world. There's an end in sight. The Father's house is beckoning us. We have an inheritance laid up in heaven, kept for us, that fadeth not away. The end of our faith is the salvation of our soul. Goal, motivation. Power, submit. Servants, be subject to your masters, to your employers. Because, and for Christ's sake. Secondly, the beauty, verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Where does the beauty come in? Well, the word thankworthy is literally translated grace. And the basic thought, says one commentator <clears throat> that Peter is um, bringing out here, is that of um, that which is beautiful, that which is attractive, that which is morally beautiful. Because rebellion, look at it. Look at these angry, angry people on the streets of our countries here in the West, in the UK and the US. Look at the faces, look at the manner and the attitude of these rebellious people on the streets. Are they not ugly? Are they not ugly? Is that not ugly, I ask you? That's not beautiful. That's not gracious. That's not attractive. That's the very opposite. Christians should not be there doing these things and having an attitude such as that. They should be subject to their masters, to the state, the state's agents, to their employers. This is beautiful. This is gracious. This is morally attractive, says God. And the reason for our submission to a nasty boss, to a boss who's perverse and self-willed. For, says Peter, beginning this verse, verse 19, for, that is because it is such an attitude, such a demeanor, such conduct before a perverse boss, employer, is beautiful in the eyes of God and pleasing to God. Isn't that what we want as Christians? For the one who chose us and bought us and gave us his only begotten son, isn't that not what we want to be pleasing to him? Well, then subject yourself to the perverse boss. For his sake so that he sees you as beautiful and not ugly. And what a powerful witness is this too, you know? That you have the hope of in you, hope of heaven in you. And the boss is looking at you and wondering why on earth does he or she conduct themselves in this way? Other employees look at you. Why, what is it that makes these Christians tick? What a witness, what a powerful witness when we conduct ourselves in a fashion such as this, as Peter here tells us to. For conscience sake, says Peter, conscience, a conscience that is devoid of offense and a conscience that's held before God. Conscience is held before God, that is. It's to know, it's to have the inner testimony that God approves of your conduct, of your confession. God approves an inner conscience, an inner peace of conscience, if you like, knowing that God approves of the way that you're conducting yourself in your place of, of employment. 
or otherwise contrarywise disapproving. A man's conscience, you see, is God's agent within him. It testifies as to whether a man's way is pleasing to God or otherwise. A conscience, you see, that leaves, all creation leaves man without excuse. God says, Romans chapter 1, but his conscience also testifies that there is a God. Oh, they know, they know, they have. Lest that is, of course, they've come to that place where they've seared their conscience as with a hot iron. But if the conscience is still active, normally active, then, of course, man knows. Man knows when his way is pleasing to God. And he knows. He knows when it's not. He knows when it's not. The conscience of the wicked is a testimony of God's wrath against them, his displeasure against them. The conscience testifies to man's way, whether it's pleasing to God or not. The Christian, of course, um, the Christian wants to have a good conscience, don't we? We want to have a conscience devoid of offense before God. We want our way to be pleasing to God and we want to have that lovely peace. Oh, the peace. You know, when you're conscious, when you've got a good conscience, your way is approving to God and there's no disturbance within. You have that peace. You enjoy that peace that passeth all understanding, as the apostle calls it. When we walk in that way, in our covenant walk of repentance and faith, that's our covenant walk day by day. And, and that's pleasing to God. Yes, we sin. Yes, we must need sin because the old nature's still with us. But we repent day by day, hour by hour. We're always at it, repenting, repenting, and turning again in faith to the cross, to the blood of the cross, and receiving again the cleansing and the forgiveness, and up and on our way again. And that's pleasing to God. God loves that. That's beautiful. That's morally beautiful in the eyes of God because we live and work and we have our being before God. All is transparent before God. John talks in 1 John chapter 1, he talks about walking in the light as he is in the light. Everything out in the open, transparent before God, nothing hidden, as though we can hide anything from God. He sees everything anyway. But that's our attitude. That's our conduct, how we conduct ourselves, how we live and work in this world as under the gaze of Almighty God. The believer covets a good conscience. And so therefore submits to the bad boss, the hostile boss, the perverse boss. Otherwise, well, the contrary to that is what, well, he'd be rebellious. He'd be bitter, he'd be angry, he'd be uncooperative. What a way to live, what a way to conduct yourself in your place of employment if you're a Christian. Huh? to be uncooperative, eh? to drag your heels, to drag your feet, to be angry and bitter all the time. You profess and you confess yourself to be a Christian, but your boss sees all your actions, sees all that you do, sees the way you do it, the attitude with which you do it. You're bitter, you're angry, and you're uncooperative. What kind of witness? What kind of testimony? I ask you is that. So we endure, we suffer the imposition, you know, not because we're timid, not because we're cowardly, not because we're afraid to speak. No, it's not that. It's for conscience sake, says Peter, for God's sake, for Jesus Christ's sake, for his approval. And of course, if the boss well, if he's cruel, if he's downright nasty, vindictive, wait on the Lord. 
Wait on the Lord. James chapter 5 and verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and you shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers will reap down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and been wanton, ye have nourished your hearts, as in, as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And then that cruel, vindictive, perverse, self-willed, employer will have his just recompense. God will deal with them. Be assured of that. Wait, I say. Wait upon the Lord. The endurance, verse 20, and thirdly, for what, what glory is it when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. To be buffeted is to be hit in the face, to be slapped in the face. But what glory, what glory is there in you being, you know, slapped in the face and enduring it, you know, enduring it, uh, uh, what does he say? Um, patiently? If you, you even take it patiently, you're slapped in the face and you take it patiently. But you got slapped in the face for your, for your faults, for your sins. There's no glory in that. You could argue it's what you deserved. You're fired because you won't work. You go trudging home to your wife and you say, I've lost my job. Oh, why? Well, maybe you tell her something else, but the real reason is because you wouldn't work. Oh, you say, I'll bear it patiently. I'll get another job. What glory, what glory is there in that if you're fired because you won't work or because you won't work hard? Huh? Or if you're constantly going to the other employees in the factory, witnessing to them, carrying a Bible boat with you and witnessing to the other employees, that's not what you're employed for. That's not what you're being paid for. And you get sacked. You get sacked because you're not working, because you're doing something that you weren't employed for. And you, you come out of the place, you know, saying, oh, they sack me because, because I'm a Christian. No, no, he didn't sack you because you were a Christian. He sacked you because you weren't working, because, when you, were, because you were witnessing when you should have been working. Yeah. But if you endure such, oh, there's no glory in that. Patient in suffering for wrongdoing. For sin, there is no glory, no glory in that. That's just your recompense for your wrongdoing. That's all that is. It's empty. There's no glory in it. There's no value in it. You've got what was coming to you. Yeah. But the opposite, for doing that which is morally good, for being morally attractive. And of course, this will bring upon you the mockery, perhaps, 
of other of your fellow employees of other workers you may be be berated um, by your fellow workers because of your conduct because of your moral attractiveness in your place of work because maybe you won't pilfer the way that they do or maybe you won't um you know, you, you won't talk about insurrection again against the company, against your bosses, you know? Oh, he's a, he's a, he's a man pleaser, you know? He, he's a boss pleaser, you know? And maybe they'll separate themselves from you because of your moral attractiveness, you know? Because, because you'll not go with them, because you'll not join in in their rebellious talk and their rebellious actions against, against the employer. You'll be ridiculed, you'll be scorned and separated from. And this is grievous, this is a burden to bear. It's awful. But bearing it patiently, with no complaint. Yeah. If ye shall take it patiently, but if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. This is what God wants. This is pleasing to God. This gets God's approval. But where, oh where, I ask you, in this Western hemisphere of ours, where can you find this, I ask you? Where? Hmm? Where can you find it in this modern world? Hmm? It's very, very hard to find. But this is Christian conduct. This is submission to authority the authority of your employer, employers, submission for Christ's sake, because he has placed them above you in the workplace. This is to show forth the praises of the God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the word of God. Yeah. But of course, this is a world that needs the gospel, isn't it? Because this is sin, is it not? Rebellion. Rebellion against God, anarchy, sedition, insurrection against God. And why the world needs the gospel, the natural man, unregenerate, not reborn. Yet that, that is. He's in rebellion against God. He can be, he may be a good employee, an excellent employee, but as long as he's in rebellion against his maker, against the Almighty, he's still, he's still in a bad place. Separated from God by his iniquity and only by the gospel can he can he be pleasing to God? Without faith, it is impossible to please God in being reconciled to God. Only then can he be approving to God, and only then can he be approving to God in his workplace as well. But a world in rebellion and anarchy, so obvious, so obvious, in our world today, a world angry, rebellious, feminists who would pour scorn on chapter 3 and verse 1, wives be in subjection to your own husbands. Even Christian women spit that out their mouths. And to be and to be in rebellion against their employers, to be, to be working against their employers in order that they might maybe uh, just maybe just bring their employer down, not even not even to get more benefits, maybe even just out of 
pure hatred and dislike. As the heart of man is poisoned, angry, wicked, rebellious. It's a rebellious world, growing more angry by the day, but no surprise there. The last day of sin, lawlessness will abound. But this, this is the church today that needs the gospel too, which takes us back to verse 2 as newborn babes. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The preaching of God's word. Newborn babes doesn't just simply re refer to um, those who were just uh, born again five minutes ago. That refers to veterans as well. And the sincere milk of the word refers to the preaching of God's word. Christians need the preaching of God's word, the whole counsel of God. Peter's counsel here with regards to employers, with regards to the state, wives with regards to their husbands. This is the preaching of God's word that the church needs badly, desperately. Preaching that, preaching that exposes our sins, uncovers them makes us uncomfortable, convicts us, and brings us again and again, hopefully brings us to repentance and to submission to God, to the gospel, submission to the state, submission to our employers, and if you're a woman, submission to your own husband. But submission to God first, without that, you've got submission to nobody else. So the gospel, the gospel needs to be preached everywhere. On the streets and in the churches as well, like never before. And preaching like we're not hearing, like we ought to be hearing. The preacher, like Isaiah, lifting up crying aloud, sparing not, telling them of their transgressions and telling them, of course, of the one mighty to save that's been said again and again. And now I'm saying it again. The church, the church in the West. I can't speak about the East, I don't know. The church in the West is a veritable mission field. It needs preaching that scorches the pews, that nails the occupants to the pews. It needs, it needs preaching. It needs preaching that affects, that penetrates the conscience, that alarms and distresses, that awakens and calls for what God demands of us all. Repentance towards God and faith towards his son, Jesus Christ, in order that men and women might indeed be born again to eternal life, saved in the way of repentance, and brought to another.